Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the session, uh, utilizing GPU computing to help with, oh, um, I cannot share. Uh, I can fix that, I'll do. Uh, yeah, please help uh, enable all four speakers to share. Thank you. Did that fix it, shall we? Uh, yes, it's uh, working now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session of utilizing GPUs in machine learning for earth sciences. Uh, this session is for about one hour and 30 minutes, and we have uh, four speakers. Uh, Stan from NVIDIA, and Dan from NASA Goddard, and Jordan also from uh, NASA Goddard, and myself, um, Phil Young from George Mason. Uh, as you see from these notes, uh, which is linked to the uh, EC page, please put in your LAM affiliation and social media and other information as you can share here. So for this session, uh, we are using Zoom and we encourage you to please put in any question, comments you may have in the chat window. You don't have to wait until the end. You can put in the, uh, your question or comments anytime to the Zoom chat window. And if you have time, uh, please also help, free, uh, help us to take notes in this document. And uh, ECIP has the meeting guidelines, which we're not gonna go through here. There's community participation guidelines. If you uh, have questions, please refer to that. And for this session, we have the objective of uh, understand the latest uh, from NVIDIA on GPU and GPU computing. And then we will hear from uh, Dan about NASA GPU computing and then understand conceptually how could we use GPU for our own earth science applications. At the end, we will have about 15 to 20 minutes for discussions about the next steps, how we could work together. Uh, so Dan, please uh, take away. All right, you want me to go first? Yes, um, uh, you introduce Stan. Oh, okay, so Stan. <clears throat> Uh, Stan Posey works for NVIDIA. He is the uh, program manager of the Earth System Science program with NVIDIA. Uh, he's been a, a long time collaborator with NASA, but a long time member of this Earth Science community, working with um, uh, basically trying to port a number of codes over to um, uh, to GPUs and enable them on GPUs. And, and uh, I want to thank Stan because I reached out to him not too long ago and said, hey, Stan, we really got this opportunity. Can you present to ESA? And he, of course, said absolutely yes. So thanks, Stan, for doing this. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and what I'll share is an overview of our support in the Earth System Science community, but more on the application side rather than technology. And certainly if you have questions about the technology, I can uh, address those as well. But just to begin, we're a company that's really driven by some of the large exascale AI systems that are distributed around the world and being installed in some cases. And these represent some of the largest systems that exist. You'll find them on the top 500 uh, in the top 10 often. And uh, each of these that you're seeing on the list I provided here are involved in the Earth System Sciences community. Now, NVIDIA itself is involved in all things Earth Sciences, including Solid Earth, but I'm really going to address Earth System Science in my talk today. Thanks. The applications that we focus on, of course, are climate, weather, and ocean modeling. Uh, these include both numerical models, where we apply GPU acceleration, as Dan was describing. But since this event is more on machine learning, I'm going to focus on that more than the numerical modeling side. But I can answer questions there if people are interested also. Now, what I'll talk about, though, is the program NVIDIA announced in November 2021 around Earth 2, which is a digital twin development of the Earth. And this is really driving our activities in machine learning research and application. 
there was uh, an article written by the CEO who launched the program. You could go and read about. I want to emphasize the second point that we're doing this working with the climate science community. This is um, contributions from them that we're applying. And it's involving practically all the technologies NVIDIA has in place to drive this program. And I'll describe some of that as we go here. And the long-term goals of this program is to select a region of the planet, ask questions about climate change impacts, and then provide uh, visual and statistical guidance. And, and to do this in a highly interactive environment. And you'll understand how some of that might be accomplished as they go through this. Uh, the early inspiration for this came from a few concepts presented by various scientists that you see listed. Our CEO sat down personally and went through each one of these. He's uh, really interested in the climate change topic and wants to do something to help drive technology in that direction. And um, many of these are involved in advisory roles to what we're doing in the program. And specifically, here are some of the advisors that are working with us. Uh, at the top, I have the NVIDIA contributors. I'm not going into detail, but they're there. And we're getting science advisors involved from organizations like ECMWF, Max Planck Institute of Meteorology, and uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which has one of those large exascale AI systems I showed on the first slide. Um, but we're also getting HPC guidance from organizations like Swiss National Supercomputing Center, who had a system that you saw earlier on that slide, uh, Dr. Singdar Lee at NASA HQ, who works uh, directly with NASA Goddard programs, and then uh, Thomas Hauser at uh, NCAR, who has a large system they're standing up now based on GPUs. And the motivation for it is uh, simple, uh, based on a nature climate change paper that was published by Tapio Schneider, one of the early inspirations that I listed. It shows how the direction we need to go is higher resolution, of course, to get to the answers that we need for understanding climate change. But we're decades from that based on the current pace of HPC. Uh, in fact, his claim is that we wouldn't get there until the year 2060 based on the current trends, which would be too late. The, the problems would have already uh, happened. Another motivation, though, is the need for interactivity with the climate data not just understanding what happens in these global climate models, but then being able to provide action to this uh, downstream and regional type of problems. And Bjorn Stevens is uh, someone really driving this concept where he understands how we can get to some of these climate scale predictions, but can't really effectively extract the information needed for uh, decision-making. Now the community is working on some of these challenges and you might've heard about the Destination Earth program out of Europe. This is uh, driven by PIs like ECMWF, uh, European Space Agency, ESA, and then EU METSAT. We're contributing to this program, but I would say largely it's still developed around high resolution numerical models. Uh, in particular, the IFS and the ICON models. Uh, and we're providing HPC systems for those, I showed them on the earlier slides at Chineca and uh, Barcelona. But uh, what NVIDIA is doing is something entirely different. We're working with those organizations because we need the data from those high resolution models for the direction we're going. And that's to develop very large scale AI training for surrogate models. And then again, provide interactivity with the climate information. So we're standing up an operational supercomputer we call Earth2 with massive scale for AI training and inference. We're focused on these fast AI surrogate models uh, using high resolution data that's available from the numerical models. And uh, we're driving some of our leading research on deep learning in this activity. We're providing the climate data activity, interactivity through our omniverse, uh, metaverse sy system, if you will, which I'll describe a little here. And then we have to have a continuous learning from Earth observation data will be provided to the Earth2 model. Uh, like I said, we're doing something a little different. AI is really one of the drivers, as I showed in the first slide of the, the trend towards uh, the performance you're seeing in the top 500, for example, where the 
HPL versus AI performance is starting to show a stronger gap as we go forward in time. And for us, that means training on systems that you would see in the top 10 uh, on the order of 4,000 GPUs in many of these cases. Uh, we've been able to scale our training on each of the systems here, the Jules Booster at ULIC, Perlmutter at uh, NERSC, and then an internal NVIDIA system, Selene. And just to give you some indication of the training time, we can reduce a 24 hour training to about an hour, 67 minutes uh, on about 4,000 GPUs. And that's the kind of scale we're looking at. I, and Earth2 has started training on some of the data sets that exist. So I'm gonna give you one quick example on the ERA-5 reanalysis data that we've done. But we've got others that we're starting to work with, including the high-res MIP from uh, IPCC CMIP-6. Um, I know that NASA, Dr. Lee, has been looking at some of the MARA-2 reanalysis data at NASA. We've got other partners who are providing data that's available. Some of the high-resolution data, say from uh, the E3SM at DOE and uh, DIAMOND, which is a, a kind of a, a MIP a model and comparison project. We haven't gotten to those levels of resolution yet, but this is kind of the roadmap where we plan to go. And then of course, the EO data will be important for the calibration and that will be provided through organizations like NASA, NOAA, and ESA. And the plan here is to still work with the large scale kilometer scale simulators and do this with a sort of a tethering approach where we're getting cloud feedback storm from the storm dynamics that are provided by these numerical models, and then being able to tether that to the AI surrogate model as we go forward in time. And again, the observations and feedback will be important for the calibration of these simulations, and uh, we'll continue working with the organizations I mentioned earlier for that, um, and including NOAA. This was announced recently, in November 2022, where NVIDIA and Lockheed were selected to provide an Earth observation digital twin. It has some of the aspects of um, destiny or destination Earth that's happening in Europe. This is a, a NOAA US based program, but this is starting to kick off and something that we'll learn from and be able to include more of the Earth observation data in our Earth 2 model to go forward. And to give you kind of an overview of the technologies that will be applied here, uh, you've got on the left, the physical world, We'll have observation data provided to that. We have the synthetic data coming from the simulations on the far right. We uh, provide these into our modulus system which helps develop our physics ML model. And then that can be visualized uh, in the digital twin sense from the interactive sense from the uh, Omniverse system that I mentioned earlier. So all the pieces of the technology are in place uh, there is development that's required in, in each of these. And I'm going to talk briefly about some of the progress we made with the AI surrogate model. This model is called ForecastNet for Fourier Forecasting Network. It's a different kind of AI architecture based on the Fourier Neural Operator. Uh, it's a collaboration between NVIDIA and several others from national labs. It's purely data driven. Later, we plan to investigate physics informed influence. And it's trained on currently the ERA-5 data available from ECMWF, this is reanalysis data. And um, we only use 20 variables of the full, I think 260 variables available in the full state. Uh, it's the highest resolution data model that we have can find in the literature, although there are new models coming out. Uh, there have been two that have been published since then, I could reference if you're interested. But what the real value here is that our speed up against NWP once you're running in inference mode can be on the order of four to five magnitudes of improvement. And then the power savings, of course, another four orders of magnitude. And we're seeing uh, exceptional weather skill for a data-driven model for some extreme weather prediction cases. I won't have time to go into a lot of detail, but this gives you a visual representation of the scale that we're training at here. The forecast now is the largest, again, that's been published so far to date, starting from 19, 2018 with the Dubin and Bauer paper, uh, who were both science advisors, by the way, on Earth2. Uh, and that's one of the features of our model that has really made this, this unique. 
and then we've got an extensive set of comparisons on the ACC scores, skill scores against the IFS, which is the basis of the uh, error five reanalysis. Uh, those all do really well based on the 20 variables that we used for the study. And uh, there's other extreme weather events that we published information on. Here's just an example of atmospheric rivers that are in the publication. I won't go into a lot of detail, but you can read about that in the paper. They do show really good skill versus ground truth. And then we did a couple of other studies I'm gonna describe that are interesting. One was to increase our variables from 20 to a nominal 26. We added six more variables. Uh, I can get the list of those. The tw first 20 are listed here, but I can get the other six we added. But could, you can see from that, just the improvement of the six variables from the red to the green, uh, how well we got close to the IFS and the um, lead times. We're getting really close to the what's possible with the uh, numerical model. And a second study I thought would, might be of interest is how we took the train model on the RFI reanalysis data and introduced initial conditions from the GFS. So this model had never been trained on GFS, but was able to predict a GFS forecast uh, based on a transfer learning approach, uh, simply from the model trained on ERA-5. Uh, so we're pushing some of the boundaries of research in these areas to make sure we can uh, drive the model towards meeting skill requirements for weather and then proceeding to the climate scale as we uh, go forward. This model forecast net and some of the other utilities to run it are available in the open source. I would encourage you to download and, and try this if you wish and contact NVIDIA. My email should be provided if you have questions on this work. And then there'll be future research topics coming. I won't get into a lot of detail, but again, we're gonna get to more higher resolution data and multi-model data, such as the high-res MIP and CMIP6 uh, icon based out of uh, MPIM is getting to a one kilometer resolution that we'll be using for training. And uh, you'll see a number of other uh, research being applied with uh, our NVIDIA Research ML group that should help us drive further towards improved skill and weather and then towards the climate scale. Thank you for your attention. I'll uh, stop there. And uh, Dan and Phil, I don't know if you'd plan Q&A at this moment or we can all wait until the end. I'm, I'm okay with either approach. Thank you. Well, Stan, there are a couple of questions you might want to address really quick that uh, were dropped in okay. the chat. So, because I, I know you're not necessarily looking at the chat. One of the questions sure. is, you know, how how can the community contribute to this effort and benefit from, from Earth 2? Um, can you download the data or the training data and stuff like that? Right, thank you. Um, well, the training data, let me start there, please. That was provided to us by ECMWF. I'm not certain what the licensing restrictions might be on that. My belief is that it may be available in public, but uh, certainly ECMWF would be the contact for that. And I'm certain there's information on their website about those restrictions, if they exist, et cetera. Uh, so they'd be the providers of that, the RFI reanalysis data. Uh, next question was about how it could be used. Uh, well, one of the things we're looking at is how we could regionalize this model. It's global at the moment, but really people take action on regional climate information. So we do plan a regional nest, if you will, of the forecast model. And for that, we need to train on regional forecast data. Uh, that's something we're getting started with, with a couple organizations who are providing that. Since if, you, know, you look around the world for weather, at least, I would say, um, of the 193 countries who produce weather forecasts, probably 175 of them run strictly a regional-based model where the others are running global. And uh, that's where we're going to try and develop some capability that others could perhaps contribute to. And, and it could not, it could be more than just regional weather. It could be regional climate as well. And models that's, like the WRF, Cosmo, et cetera, contribute to that. Thanks. Well, that's a great uh, segue to the, to the next question, which was talk about scale. So uh, talk about the global and regional scales real quick. What, what are the, what's the targets? Well, we're currently at the era five, which is 25 kilometer, I believe. And uh, we plan to be able to train to the one kilometer. Uh, if not being able to train on that directly, uh, applying some downscaling approach, but you know, that's still the roadmap. 
get to the one kilometer global. Um, okay. That seems possible. For regional, we're not sure on the limitation there, whether it's that important since you've you've not got the same demand at the regional level, mm -hmm. since I don't know what kind of domain we'll be defining for that region, but that should be, that should be reasonably straightforward. Uh, I suppose we just haven't seen the regional data that's of quality that we get from the RFI reanalysis and why we haven't made more progress there. The, the, the training is still somewhat restricted with the data that's been available. Uh, so the herd data from NOAA would be another target. We haven't started that yet, but that is offered at three kilometer and it will get to higher resolution in its future. But at the moment, that's one of our targets for regional, the uh, HRRR, which is based on the WARF model. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there are a couple other questions in there and uh, uh, into the chat. One, one is about uncertain, and the other is about visualization of large data sets. Um, that could take, do you want to answer those now or you're on table for those? So the first one is more on the UQ, uh, uncertainty yeah. quantification yeah. topic. Yeah, that's certainly an area of research for our um, NVIDIA research team. Uh, we've got some work on that I can provide if, if you'd like to sh shoot me an email, it's right there. Second one on visualization, yes, we're doing work with the ICON model and can show you some visualizations that have been developed with that. Well, how do you, and visualize, get, how do you visualize all this large data? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let someone answer that who, who can give a more <laughs> precise answer than what I would. I mean, certainly the amount of data is, <clears throat> is, uh, is the challenge, and how we manage that in the I.O. operations is, is what probably needs to be described. And there I'm not entirely certain, but we have published details on that. But please contact me on these. These are great questions, and I can certainly get you the details you, you desire. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you, yeah, what, Stan and, and Dan. Yeah, I'll stop sharing then. Thank you. Our next speaker where, uh, is Dr. Duffy. And Dr. Duffy is the head of uh, NASA GADA uh, CISTO, which stands for the Computational and Information Science and Technology Office, and one of the two NASA high-end computing facility, NCCS, uh, is under the CISTO. So uh, Dr. Duffy has been leading the NASA high-end computing uh, at GADA for many years. In fact, he served as the NCCS uh, uh, director. And so it has been piloting on uh, not only high-end computing, but also especially on how to use GPU computing for NASA sciences. And he's going to introduce that. Then please go ahead. Okay, I'm going to see if I can't uh, share the screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. All right, uh, Phil, I may need you to share. Can you share? Uh, Wait. Yeah, I might need you to share. Yeah, if you send that to me, I... it's in the it's in the um, it's in the, the Google Drive. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm going to have to set my permissions, which will take longer than we want to here, to with uh, with the, the web browser. Can you you know the Google Drive that you mentioned uh, had us drop our um, things in? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get to there. <clears throat> Sorry, everybody. We we're trying to test some of this out before the meeting, but uh, you know the, the meeting opened up just a few minutes before, so we're, <clears throat> we're going to have to wing this. So, um, and I'm not, I'm not a native Zoom, uh, as you can imagine, I'm on a NASA computer, which doesn't really allow Zoom, so I'm not a native Zoomer. Yeah, Dan, I didn't see your presentation in the folder. <clears throat> uh, which yeah. folder did you put in? The one, the one that you uh, you had us drop in. It's the one with, uh, actually, it's the same one that had, uh, I'll find it for you. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you what we can do is we, if you want to jump to Jordan first, and then I can, we can come back to me. That way you and I can work on uh, getting that one set up. Um, then I'm, I'm downloading your slides. Uh, oh, me Jordan. Check. Jordan's got it. Oh, okay. That, that's great. So, Jordan, if you can help uh, share your screen, that would be really helpful. It's not that big. It's got one movie. I put one movie in there to make it interesting. So, not nearly as uh, nice as some of Stan's slides. Can you 
Can you see right, it? Thank you, Jordan. Yep, perfect. Thanks, Jordan. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. So I'm Dan Duffy. I'm the, the chief of the Computational Information Science Technology Office um, and Cisco 6, uh, Code 606 here at Goddard. Uh, and uh, that's a, apparently the longest uh, title office at Goddard. So um, that's what we, uh, that's our, <clears throat> that's our claim to fame. No, go ahead to the next slides here. So we run uh, the, the basically out of the high-end computing program, which uh, Dr. Sundar Lee, which um, uh, Stan mentioned as one of the um, people that's driving some of these requirements from the weather and climate community. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, has two major programs within his high-end computing program. There's the high-end computing capability program out at NASA Ames, and then the scientific computing program run here out of Cisco in the 606 organization that I, I run here at NASA Goddard on the East Coast. And so I'm going to focus mostly on the scientific computing program, but also a lot of it applies to both sides of the coast. And uh, you'll see some of the, the capabilities that we have. Um, I'll show you some of the systems we have, the architectures that we're going towards, uh, both on premises and in the cloud, and then we'll hand you back to Jordan. And Jordan's going to take you through some of the applications that are being run on here. So I'm going to take you through the systems, the infrastructure uh, that we're building. Uh, Stan talked about some of the, the cool things that NVIDIA is doing, but but here's what we're doing within NASA to help you know supply some of the capabilities for AI and ML. So next slide. Uh, my organization, which is the sister organization, really kind of does everything from <clears throat> the high end networking and security through on premises high performance computing, which many groups have done for a long time. Data science group, which Jordan has been a large part of, uh, which does large scale analytics and artificial intelligence machine learning. We also have a scientific visualization studio, which there was a question about visualization. There's a large group that does that. And then finally, we've been getting into commercial clouds environment, which I'll talk about as well. So it's really from bits on the wire through understanding is what my group is doing with science. So we are in science, funded by science, and uh, we're not a part of the CIO's organization. So next slide, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of change lately, and, and Stan talked about some of these things, what's happening you know, uh, in the industry, uh, and, and why are we making some of these shifts in our architectures? Well, there's a huge surge for these um, uh, demand for these AI and ML capabilities. Um, and the applications are driving a lot of the underlying hardware that's needed to uh, uh, to perform these. We um, could have an entire session on trustworthy AI ML, which is important, and, and we are trying to understand from the computing center's perspective what we need to do and how it changes our architecture to support trustworthy AI ML. And we're not just talking about uncertainty quantification, which is extremely important, but also about uh, reproducibility uh, and other things within, you know, uh, uh, equity and fairness and, 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 you know, all that stuff with respect to trustworthy AI, it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, we've seen a huge rapid adoption of cloud computing. Uh, this year is the, the year of open science for NASA. Uh, and then, of course, as uh, also Stan mentioned, there's a huge convergence of these exascale architectures that are um, kind of bringing together the, what I say are these four sort of components, HPC, big data, AI, ML, and uh, cloud computing all together. Uh, we do have a, a, a splurge of processors across the um, architectures now, and, and that is driving lots of power and cooling requirements and facilities constraints that are very difficult for us to uh, uh, to figure out on-premises, and that's increasing hardware costs. Supply chains are, 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 are just unbelievably hard these days. All I'm saying is that this is a seed of change towards this hybrid architecture that we're going towards, which is a combination of on-premises and commercial cloud computing and this convergence of AI, ML, and HPC. So next slide. Uh, the NCCS, which here at Goddard, uh, has a traditional HPC cluster, uh, basically uh, <clears throat> you know, 127,000 cores, about eight petaflops of peak computing. Um, this, to give you an idea of what that means, that's you know eight times 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second. Uh, that's about the equivalent of every person on the earth, all eight billion people, multiplying two numbers together for about uh, 11 or 12 days straight. Uh, that's what this computer can do in a single second. So that gives you an idea of the of the big numbers that we're talking about, and the systems that uh, um, that uh, Stan showed are orders of magnitude. They're ten and a hundred uh, times, and maybe even uh, slightly bigger than the, than the one we have here. We do have private clouds uh, on premises. We have AI ML engineered systems, which I'll show you in a second. We have a centralized storage, large curated storage set, storage sets, uh, data that's much bigger than twenty petabytes now. That's the type of thing that we're going to merge. Um, and evolve more into a data lake concept. And then we have this managed cloud environment for commercial cloud computing. Okay, go ahead, Jordan. So we'll talk about some of the capabilities they, uh, oh, sorry, science, uh, customers and science, right, and challenges we have here. A large number of customers, uh, what you're gonna show, I'm gonna show you in just a second is output from the uh, GMAO. The GMAO is one of the uh, team members that Stan supports and, and, and has talked to many times. They run a um, the Goddard Earth Observing System, which is a, a global weather uh, atmospheric model 
uh, in a global circulation model, which is the picture on the right, and I'll show you a, a moving just a second. We also support GIS. GIS is doing more um, decadal or, or climate studies, as well as looking at the temperature of the Earth, which they just released the last couple of weeks. So the global temperature, uh, the average temperature of uh, 2022 was in the top six. Again, uh, they released that uh, just last week. And then a number of other groups from a large amount of land uh, programs, land information systems, um, field campaigns, including things like the um, Arctic boreal uh, experiments, um, high mountain Asian terrains. These are areas of the earth that are reacting to climate very quickly. Um, disaster programs, uh, supporting various instruments like I said too and others. So, you know, thousand, thousand users, 150 projects. Uh, there's lots of challenges that these users have and, and a lot of challenges we have, which is one of the biggest thing is keeping pace with these science requirements and their demand for AI and ML capabilities. You know, we are near at our peak with respect to facilities and, and adding more facilities is going to um, cost a lot of money. So we are looking at, at in putting more of that money into things like uh, the these converged architectures and code modernization and, and workforce development and cloud computing. So next slide, see if this plays for you, Jordan. Uh, this is the picture of the uh, aerosols that and it should play if you click again. This is aerosol optical depth at uh, 550 nanometers. This is the type of, of uh, simulation that Stan is looking at to, to create training data. Uh, Stan, I think this is at, uh, this I think is just at 12, it may be at six kilometer resolution from the GS output. But what you're looking at here is a number of different uh, um, aerosols and you're just looking at the total optical depth of the aerosol from, from space, so from the, over the vertical column. And this was driven um, by the fires in Australia. You can see the data up in the upper left. If we let it run until the uh, um, late in the year, you'll see the rapid fires in Australia jump up. And there was a, back in 2019, 2020, there was a, <clears throat> a huge increase there. You can also see dust clouds coming off of uh, Africa, moving all the way across the Atlantic. You can get, they get swirled up in, uh, into Atlantic cyclones and hurricanes. Uh, you see a lot of uh, sulfates and nitrates coming from us, from people in uh, Asia, as well as the US and, and Europe. And you can just see how these things really circulate around the globe. Again, this is the type of global simulation at, at 12 kilometers, six kilometer and more that we can use as training input for the uh, for these surrogate models, these trained surrogate models. And you just saw the, uh, the fires in Australia go through and how quickly those smoke clouds really distribute around the globe. But this is a physics-based model, a traditional MPI, you know, a distributed memory um, model uh, that's quite large, uses, you know, thousands and thousands of processors to run. Okay, next slide. So the capabilities that we have on-premise are, 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 I'm sure they look familiar to you. We have a combination of um, uh, V100s and A100s. Uh, we have uh, just a, not that many nodes right now. The reason we don't have huge numbers of nodes is that uh, is that we don't have a lot of applications that that will run across many many um, compute nodes right now for for artificial intelligence and machine learning. These systems that uh, that we get from you know a variety of vendors, they have, you know most of them have Nvidia, although there's other vendors out now that are doing some really good stuff with GPUs. But these have V100s. They've got lots of um, um, a lot of memory. In some cases, you know, uh, you know 768 gig of RAM or even one terabyte of RAM memory. Where that's one of the things that has been a useful for, for us. If your training set is large, getting that training set in the memory and training on that uh, on that training set from memory is very, very useful. Lots of uh, network interfaces, both to uh, the, the data lake concept as well as to interconnected between the nodes is important. And local scratch spaces also help us to stage data in for training. Uh, these are um, highly uh, used for, for mostly to some more traditional single node or small numbers of multi-node AI ML uh, training sets. Um, we did purchase an NVIDIA uh, DGX um, a couple years ago and trying that out to see what, you know, if we go from four GPUs to eight GPUs in a single node, how does that benefit applications? Uh, it does well, um, but I think our applications still need to, some work to really be able to benefit from that architecture. Next slide, I gotta hurry up because there's a few more slides to go through. We've also put GPUs in HPC. That's what Stan was talking about in terms of looking at some surrogate models, basically taking a physics-based model, adding surrogate components or trained components into the model and running it there. Those are the A100s there. We've got about 12 nodes there, and we're still working on porting some applications over to those systems. Uh, next slide, we'll talk about the NASA Ames team as well. They have a number of capabilities across HPC and NASA Ames with a set of uh, A100s along the way. 
So again, you, you very, very similar type systems between NASA Ames and NASA Goddard to enable both HPC as well as AI and ML uh, on these uh, GPU based systems. Go ahead, next slide. So those are the on-premise stuff, but we ventured our way into the cloud and we have a, a science managed cloud environment that really helps people get started very quickly in commercial cloud computing. Uh, and it's really designed for collaboration and rapid startup uh, and rapid uh, just, just development. Uh, next slide is, is, is helps us show you a little bit more about the projects. We've got about 60 projects there. These are not huge projects, but these are projects that are looking at uh, data analysis. They are using uh, GPUs out there, whether they're using GPUs through something like a Jupyter Notebook or using SageMaker. Uh, they're doing a lot of training. And this is where a lot of the open science work in the year of the open sciences is, is happening more and more out in the, in the cloud world, which makes sense, right? So we're sharing data out there, sharing codes that people can access uh, and getting the data out into um, you know, much more fair uh, fairness and getting data out into more, into more people's hands. Um, so the, the, the cloud-based analytics platform that we have out there for science is really based on JupyterHub. It, it's rapidly deployable infrastructure as code. You can set up a, uh, a basically a Kubernetes container that has a GPU or doesn't have a GPU. You can do CPU or GPU there. Uh, a large number of different AI ML software stacks from Pangeo to, to whatever you want out there. We can, it's very customizable. And so we have a, now the nice thing is what we've done is we've coupled this front end, this Jupyter Hub front end with a parallel cluster. Uh, and the parallel cluster is typically CPU clusters, but you can use GPU clusters. You just gotta be worried about, worry about the cost of those in the cloud because they can be quite, quite costly. But once you deploy code, for example, you're maybe you're training the code, you've got it working on your GPU and you really want to do some training, you can pass it over to the uh, cluster that's that's got GPUs, or you can bring that on premises and, uh, and train it there. And then you can deploy your training model in the cloud. So lots of different options here. Next slide. I got to finish up here. This is just a picture of the Jupyter Hub and the parallel cluster, how they kind of fit together. Go ahead to the next slide. And the, this is basically the future hybrid architecture. One column on the left is on-premises, the right column is commercial cloud, and uh, they're very similar. And so that's what we want to try to do is we want to try to make these things very similar with similar capabilities, both with be with uh, uh, sort of a, at the bottom, some type of open data lake, which we can get open data access to, but also share data between on-premises and cloud. Again, giving the users the ability to flow back and forth, uh, to be able to train or deploy applications where it makes sense, um, depending on the use case and depending on the collaboration. So I think that's my final slide. So I, oh, oh, yeah, one more slide, NASA killer application. So uh, I'll jump right in. <clears throat> yeah, as you can imagine, we are, talk, uh, we are talking about uh, onboard applications, so really talking about AI and ML at the, at the, at the extreme edge. We're also talking about uh, uh, AI in orbit, but really it's very similar to what uh, Stan was talking about, so Earth System Digital Twins, or if you want to extend that to a sort of a universal digital twin. So basically looking at how we can um, create digital twins of solar systems or exoplanets or even the universe. So it's a very lofty goal. And I think that's it. I think there was a question that flew by that I didn't quite catch. Uh, yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, so from the audience, if you have any question, please uh, put it in the chat window. And Dan, can you yeah, see? Sure. Okay. Can you, if you want to go on, I'll address them in the, in the chat. Uh, oh, you can just uh, speak to the questions. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see here. Uh, slide six, using the GPU cluster. Um, uh, the customer is doing it. Um, let me think about that one, Phil. I'll get back to you on that one. Let me address that one in the chat window. Slide seven is easier. Yes, all the visualizations that we have are public, and I can give you the, I can give you the, um, uh, the URL for that. I'll drop that into the chat window if anybody wants to see the, the yeah, that would the, be great. The total visualization, but I can also put a link towards that one. Uh, and yes, GPUs are a part of the of the commercial cloud, um, and so we have offerings to we can do. Um, container-based GPUs, or you know, you can use um, the SageMaker GPU type systems. Uh, okay. And somebody mentioned it's not just NASA that's doing the Year of Open Science. That's a good point. Uh, the White House uh, directives also has uh, Open Science for equitable research as well. There's a great link in the chat window about that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, our next speaker will be Jordan. And Jordan is a computer engineering with um, 
the science data processing branch within NASA Goddard system. And his main interest is to shorten the gap between earth science and artificial intelligence by means of hardware accelerated software applications, which include the development of GPU-backed data structures to support satellite data formats, deep learning applications to streamline a rotation process, and the portability of software to support open science initiatives via cloud and on-premise environments. And he's going to talk to us about um, an overview of how the AI machine learning is being used at the uh, Gata Data Science Group. Uh, Julian, please uh, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Just checking the audio here. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to be kind of introducing some of the work that we have been doing related to GPUs and artificial intelligence and machine learning at NASA, particularly our group. Um, so our group is led by Dr. Mark Harrow, um, and we're kind of a data science group. And so you're going to go ahead and talk about some of the motivations that we have, uh, some of the AI for in space science uh, objectives, how GPUs play into this um, whole idea of accelerating and using artificial intelligence for science, and just provide a couple of research overview of AI models that we have in play. Uh, the motivation, I think, is very simple. Like We have earth science that are holding growing and exponential rate. We're just facing a fast-moving big data problem. We have hundreds of constellations of satellites that are just producing a lot of data that we need to uh, make useful for ourselves. And the idea here is that we have proven that we have the computational capabilities to actually process all of these data, but we now need to make sure that we have the software and we have the algorithms to actually make, make good use out of it. Um, GPU so far, they have proven to actually accelerate some of these data structures that are um, capable of, of like processing remote sensing data and kind of satellite imagery. But we need to kind of combine them with artificial intelligence to then get the most out of them. Um, the roles right now of GPUs in earth science, they kind of started as this visualization uh, hardware where we could actually accelerate some of the visualizations that we had. But now it's more than that. Now we actually can use it to more do actual compute on them. We can actually use it to accelerate some of our AML algorithms, but we can also use them in kind of like the normal tasks that we would use CPUs for. And the idea here is that we can use CPU polarization uh, most of the time, but then use GPUs where it actually makes sense in the applications that we can actually get the best out of them. The other thing is that um, GPUs have actually proven to streamline some of and most of these computations, and they have enhanced most of our visualization capabilities. But they also work on both like the traditional HPC, where we have, let's say, a small set of data where we want to produce a lot of output that we can analyze, but also on the target analysis applications where we have thousands of terabytes of data and we want to kind of synthesize an actual product uh, to get out of. And I think that the main idea that we should kind of move towards soon and that we have been working on is trying to get GPUs in each one of these stages of these machine learning workflow. Uh, so we can actually accelerate each one of those phases and we can have kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, GPU accelerated workflow. I'm just gonna kind of introduce how we have been kind of dividing our approach to Earth and space science in regards to AI ML. Uh, we go from the hardware and software infrastructure where uh, Dan kind of introduced most of the on-premises and cloud resources that we leverage. But then we can go from there to the science applications and big data analytics where machine learning plays a vital role in there. But we then also can go to the AI algorithm development and onboard implementations. How can we get to synthesize and to do some of the on the edge uh, processing before the data actually lands into the earth or ground? Um, if we take a closer look at this, we can kind of divide it into two main areas. The first one is into the kind of the observation coordination of mission operations. And this is where we do kind of the on the edge data analysis, where we have onboard autonomy for fault detection and many other applications that are actually working on the actual satellites themselves. And the other section that we have is kind of the science advancement. How, how can we use computer vision? How can we use kind of intelligent systems to then do uh, data fusion of the data we have on the ground, do big data analytics and discover patterns within the data and so forth. So the main idea here is that we can combine some of these techniques both on, on, on board and on the ground uh, to get some of the workflows and some of the analysis that we need. 
And I'm just going to kind of briefly uh, describe what, what our group does is we co-develop software with scientists, but we'll pitch some of these scientific goals. And the main idea is that we both explore some of the software and hardware technologies to advance this objective, but we also advance the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning within the four NASA science mission divisions. And the idea here is that we can reuse some of the algorithms that we, we use across earth sciences to helios fixes to any other of the, of the other science mission divisions, but we can also reuse some of these data, data sets and do some of the transfer learning uh, by doing and getting some of the features that we learned from these models. Uh, so now I'm just gonna start kind of doing some overview of the applications that we have. I'm gonna start with some of the onboard applications, uh, some of my groups to us. The first one is Razor, and the idea of this is to have intelligent agents that can do onboard fault detection. And the point is, is to avoid having this human in the loop that detects some of these uh, faults on the systems and having intelligent systems actually, one, preventing these faults, but also detecting them on time so we can uh, do additional um, services when, when they are needed, but without actually having to wait a human to actually look at all of these telemetry data and then synthesize the information. Uh, this project is actually led by um, Ivana Gysi, where we're trying to get a constellation of these satellites actually working on, on a demo with space cubes. This other application is actually doing some calibration using machine learning. And the idea here is that we already have some of these instruments and some of these spectrometry spectroscopy instruments, they have bias. So the idea is that we use some of these regression algorithms, particularly 1D autoencoders, to then calibrate some of these instruments and get additional and, and more functional information that we can then use uh, to monitor our system, to monitor our systems, our instruments, but also to actually get better science data out of the onboard systems. Uh, this application is actually working on a scheduling system of multiple satellites on the same way. The idea is that we have an environment of variables and an environment of these satellites where they can communicate between themselves autonomously, autonomously, but they can also do scheduling between themselves. So if we have a, let's say satellite A that has some issues with some instruments, we can actually use satellite B to then recover and some of the passes that are going to be on the Earth orbit and then recover some of the data so we don't lose any of those observations that satellite A have to do. And the idea here is that at some point we're going to have some of the uh, autonomous grid or space cubes or even other satellites that we can then trust that they're going to be taking the observations that we actually need them to get better and synthesize observations for ground. Um, now let's go to some, some of the science advancement and this is kind of once we actually have the data what can we do? And I kind of divide those within how the machine learning workflow looks like. So the first piece is kind of these exploratory data analyses. And for that, we have this spectrocast hyperspectral tool where we can actually do some of the data exploration and actual semi-supervised learning by just looking at the data and just outputting some of the patterns and features that we can learn from unsupervised learning. And the idea here is that we can actually do some of the exploratory data analysis by using unsupervised machine learning without having to look for the patterns ourselves or to try to do some of that exploratory analysis on by hand. And one of the other nice things about this software is that they can actually apply for, let's say, remote sensing or science data, but also for like X-ray light curves that come from planetary data for exoplanet detection. Another application similar to this is what I call the uh, mass spec neon data visualizer. And the idea here is also this reliable user, user filling interface that can be used by, let's say, people that are new to machine learning. And the idea is that once you have the actual data, you can then reuse some of these unsupervised learning algorithms and then get a sense of some of the patterns. Now, once you actually have the patterns, you can actually manually label some of these data. So you can do in-depth analysis with other algorithms like deep learning, machine learning, and so forth. Uh, so the idea here is that we can actually use some of these machine learning algorithms into that exploratory data analysis phase. Uh, once we move to the data preparation side of things, we have this library that's called Terra GPU, which is that the idea is that we actually have most of these remote sensing uh, data structures on CPU. So this library does the whole conversion to the backend as GPUs. So we can actually have the same interface that we have for CPUs, but then moving some of these data structures into GPUs and doing the calculations on the fly. Uh, the nice thing is that we have seen that there is an outstanding potential for converting some of these data structures on GPUs when calculating, let's say, vegetation indices, when calculating like near distance or doing subsampling of 
uh, some of these remote sensing data sets by just adding them to the actual um, GPU data structures. Uh, this is one of those examples. And here we can see that we were using some of these GPU data structures to then calculate vegetation indices over, over an HLS or harmonized lens and Sentinel-2 data set, and then getting outstanding performance out of just moving it to a single GPU. Uh, this is another example of how we can use machine learning and GPUs on the data preparation side of things. In this particular use case, we're actually using machine learning algorithms to do data fusion at different scales of the data. And the idea here is that once we do this data fusion and have the data as a kind of a data cube that is machine learning ready, we can then do additional in-depth analyses of some of these data to then do classification, do regression, uh, do productivity assessment of ores and, and other analyses that we couldn't do if we didn't have this data fusion algorithm in place. Uh, now we, we can go to the kind of the traditional uh, building and training um, machine learning and deep learning models and how GPUs uh, are beneficial in them. And this particular example, we have the combination of MODIs, multispectral data and precipitation data to get some NDVI uh, measurements. And the idea here is when we don't have the ability of, of getting multispectral data in some of the locations or passes, we can then predict some of the NDVI observations across additional time. And the idea here is that we were using a long term memory model to then predict some of these NDVI values to then monitor forest, monitor geo, like, geo crop estimates, and monitor like food security issues that we, could, we couldn't we could see actually without doing some of the forecasting that we wanted to do with this um, project. Uh, this is another example of monitoring water quality by using um, GPUs and machine learning. In this case, we actually didn't have many observations of, of some of these um, water quality samples. So what we did is that we created synthesized data and uh, Sabine supervised approach to then look at some of the water quality in the GCP Bay in Maryland. And the, one of the main benefits from here is that by analyzing and adding synthesis, synthetic data to this project, we're able to actually get better predictions and get a better output that we can then use on um, future analyses of the uh, water quality of these um, reservoirs. So now let's go to like more in-depth applications, uh, more on the classification side of things. And in this project, we're actually looking at hotspots in Senegal. And we're trying to find food security issues that would be happening on the Senegal area. So the idea is that um, we're using convolutional neural networks to then do segmentation and identify classes from this land cover features at two meter scale. So we're doing very high resolution imagery that couldn't be possible with, let's say, Landsat or any other um, high, like low resolution data sets. And the idea is that we can process terabytes of data that would take us months to process with our GPUs into just a couple of hours uh, by just using some of these GPU-based data structures. Uh, we can also do compositing of the entire data set, which in this case is 14 terabytes of data in just a few hours compared to some of the couple of days that would take us to actually do some of the composites when we're using CPU only um, workloads. Another example and uh, moving away from, let's say some of the traditional segmentation applications is doing actual um, three height estimates by using convolutional networks, but just for regression estimates on this case. And the idea here is that we want to um, take and monitor forest guardians to actually monitor forest loss but also get estimates of biomass production in some of these locations where we just don't have airborne estimates. So the idea is that we train with airborne data from ISAT and any other of the airborne um, satellites that we have. Uh, and then we actually train some of these models to then get estimates in locations that we just didn't get any estimates or locations and times or epochs that we just couldn't get overpasses of the satellites over them. Okay. Moving on to more of the operational side of things, we can actually leverage GPUs on the operational side of things. And this one of the examples where we have this workflow where we run on our per request basis of doing cloud segmentation of war imagery, which is two meter and half meter resolution data. And the idea is that we have uh, GPUs that are kind of on premise, and then we also have kind of on demand that we when we actually need them on the cloud. Uh, one additional example, and I think this is actually the last one, is uh, doing water mapping across all of the models data set across uh, multi-seasonalities. And the idea here, again, is having GPUs both for the actual training of the data, but then 
to actually accelerate some of the inference that we have and then improving the way we actually um, standardize kind of our operations across both the cloud and then on-premises resources. And this was actually one of the uh, best examples of this where we have billions of pixels. Yeah, they constitute data frames or rows where we, we would take just days to actually train one of these models. And right now by just leveraging GPUs, it would just only take a couple of minutes to actually get the model trained. And then a couple of minutes to actually get some of the actual predictions of these um, modus tiles. And this is just kind of the, the scale that we have been uh, working on in regards to this project where uh, we have been kind of tiling the system and then doing parallel batches for GPU um, inference over all of the actual data set that we're working with. Uh, so just a couple of um, closing remarks. Uh, we actually need to leverage some of the accelerated hardware to, to keep up with the pace of volume that we're getting from earth science um, imagery. But then some of these AML pipelines, they can just be easily, easily accelerated by GPUs. The idea is that instead of just accelerating some of these um, actual like training workflows, we can actually accelerate some of the computing and some of the inference, even the post-processing of um, some of these data sets. Um, there's still some limitations, like particularly for, for those remote sensing um, enthusiasts where we just don't have some of these GOT um, GPU readers available yet that we are, we've kind of worked on towards that. Uh, but we also have uh, some challenges that we, we need to like uh, finish up um, if we want to have CPU and GPU kind of a word software that we can just uh, move between simulants. Yeah, this is the end of my slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. Um, do we have any questions from our audience? Or uh, please just put it in the chat window. Uh, Jordan, I do have several questions for you in the chat window. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, sure. Let's see. Okay. How do yeah, you so manage Jordan, training data sets within and across? Yeah, yeah, Jordan, I was going to build on what uh, Phil asked there is how do you uh, how do you get these training sets out of the how do you pry these training sets out of the scientist's hands so we can share them? Uh, so one of the main things that we have done is um, we kind of created this model survey and it's just kind of a this questionnaire of questions that we ask scientists before we take some of the data. So we're trying to standardize how the input comes from scientists. This is just kind of to make it easier so we can reuse software. Now how we monitor some of these training data, we actually use software like ML flow and, and, and some of the other packages that allow us to kind of have versions of these data sets. Uh, so we can actually like have a model that is tagged with a specific version that is tagged to specific training data set. In regards to how can they be shared across projects? So, and with the community. So all of the, let's say open source um, satellite imagery can be actually shared with the community. And sometimes what we have been doing is just um, publishing them in some of these registries of like public data sets like DAC and, and so forth. But then uh, there's proprietary data like the, the war view and, and commercial data we just can share. Um, we can kind of share the methods that we have been using for, for getting there, but um, some of these data is just, there's just a challenge. In regards to sharing across the projects, we normally just do transfer learning of some of these models. So we have kind of these um, initial models that have some of the features that we have learned. And then we can um, sometimes reuse some of that data. Uh, not that Sometimes this is just not possible just because of the kind of the feature scale of some of these data sets. Um, but we can actually use some of these models across uh, different projects. <laughs> and then um, changes have to be done to the model systems where they can be drawn on the GPUs. Uh, this, this is kind of a, 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 kind of a two-way question. So using models that have been trained on GPUs and then using them on the CPU, we can do model pruning. And that is just kind of like, interacting some of the weights from these models. And we have been doing that one, like we train models on GPUs and then use them on board. Uh, but then using models that were trained on CPU and then uh, moving them to the GPU, uh, sometimes we have issues with, with some of those just because of the, the formats of these, uh, how the models were saved. Uh, but most of the time uh, we are kind of able to just leverage some of the APIs uh, that we have in hand, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, like even scikit-learn has some support for that. Dan, you had additional questions from from those, or they covered? No, I just wanted. Um, um, I just wanted to kind of put a little a little uh, uh, caveat on to the question that uh, that Phil raised. It is difficult getting the training sets and all the data out to the public uh, whenever whenever possible, and we're trying to do that as much as possible. 
Yeah, thank you, Dan and Jordan. Um, All right, Phil, you want me to do the introduction for you? Yeah, please. Okay, our last speaker today, uh, and then we can jump into some conversation, is um, Dr. Xiaowei Yang, or Phil Yang, from the Geography and Geoinformation Science Department at George Mason University. Uh, and uh, Phil is also the, the uh, director of an NSF Spatial Temporal Computing Center uh, there that we have been partnered with uh, Phil for quite a few years. They do some great work and have some great students down there. And he's going to talk on GPU support to Earth Science Computing Testbed. Uh, he's going to report on that. So go for it, Phil. Uh, thank you, Dan. Can you hear me and see my screen? Uh, I can see and hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you, Dan. This is a collaborative uh, work. In fact, as Dan just introduced, it's a close collaboration with uh, Dan and Mike at um, uh, NASA Goddard CISTO. And at GMU said we engage uh, many students. In fact, these are the students who has been working with me. And we also engage students from uh, UC Santa Barbara and UC Berkeley to working with us. Uh, I will introduce the work uh, through five uh, aspects uh, from the background and objective, and also the applications that we selected to conduct this study and testbed, and also what is the test process and the experimental results, and what does those results mean to us, and some recommendations, and what's the next step. So background, as we all know that AI machine learning have become uh, very popular in earth science and space science, and the big data challenge, in fact, um, also pose a grand challenge to the computing side. That's why we're adopting GPUs to help uh, with our applications. Uh, but there are some optimization needs to be done to help improve the leveraging of the GPU computing. So the objective of this uh, project is to develop uh, open source package that can be used to test GPU platforms and also compare the performance of these different applications in several different platforms, uh, which includes the PC that everybody uses on a daily basis, uh, but also the clusters from uh, different uh, vendors and also LASA, uh, uh, CISTO and CCS, the clusters that then just introduced and also use several metrics to quantify the performance of different applications on these different GPU clusters. And then uh, one step further is that how to parallelize and distribute learning strategy to further improve uh, the application. Uh, the fourth part, we're still working on that. And also to generate a community report summarizing and recommending how to leverage multi-GPU clusters to speed up uh, the applications that we're running and to share with uh, the Earth Science community. So uh, we selected five applications. Uh, the first one we select is cloud classification. Uh, this is a project, in fact, uh, funded in the past by Dan and uh, Sisto. And as you see from the figure, we're using this to detect the lunar cloud uh, with the input uh, satellite observations. And in order to leverage the GPU, we need to go through several steps, as you see on the left side, uh, about four steps. And each of these, for example, this is very small, uh, but we're gonna share the slides so you can see that uh, it has a link, 19 or one, two, three, four, five. And these are the user guide for how to utilize the open source. So if you're interested, you can go to the open source site, which is linked at the end of uh, this presentation. The second application that we looked at is to retrieve the PM 2.5 data sets using GOES R data, GOES 16 or 17, and also the ground PM 2.5 measurements from ERLAU and Purple Earth sensors. And again, we use machine learning in this process, and we go through several steps to optimize or uh, change the model simulation so they can be run on GPUs. And we also shared the code and the enablement of GPU to run these applications. And the third one is the satellite image mapping. This is one of the students who's interested in to look at how could we detect different features from the satellite images. And on the uh, figure lower right side, you can see the lakes, the loads network, the buildings were detected and we're using machine learning, uh, specifically in the GAN model to uh, extract those features. And again, how to uh, GPU enable this, we detailed that and load 
use a guide for that. Uh, the fourth application is the social media classification. Uh, in fact, this project is funded by NSF uh, COVID-19 rapid response. What we did is that we take the tweets, uh, data sets with geographic location and try to find out is that a positive or negative tweets uh, based on what they hear. And then we use that to uh, look at the Ukraine war when Russia invasion of Ukraine happened last year to see different countries response to that events. So uh, this entire process uh, is also detailed with the source code uh, labeled here. And the fifth one is to uh, detect different types of sea ice um, using the high resolution images, for example, to detect the thick ice, the thin ice, the open water. And this is using um, machine learning. And we, are, uh, we developed the algorithms and the models to do this, but also uh, opened the software so taking those uh, five applications, we went through these five steps. Uh, the first step is to analyze the problem, which means the application, to see what are the scientific problems, so what are the application model, uh, AI machine learning model we used, and is it data intensive or computer intensive, and does it already support GPU or only support CPU? And then we install the package on CPU, on GPU cluster, use uh, different platforms, and then we train the model using the training data sets and uh, then enable that on the uh, GPU cluster to do further tests. And then at the end, we validate the results and to compare the, uh, the scientific results and also look at the performance gains after we enabled the GPU runs of the applications. So these are the details of the five applications uh, in terms of the AI machine learning model, DNN, CNN, and what is the mathematical equation behind them, and what are the parameters in the equation that we are trying to tune to improve the model. And we don't have to go through the details here, uh, but what we did is that on the computing side, on GPU side, we also uh, fine tuning the APOC batch learning rate neural numbers and layer numbers to see how the GPU clusters respond into these different uh, parameters tuned and find the best uh, spot or the sweet spot for running the model to put, obtain the most accurate results. And this is one of the example about how to uh, tune them in the scripting. And then we looked at um, these four or five different platforms, including the desktop as a benchmark. If we run that on the desktop, we have the CPU and also GPU. And then uh, the other four are GPU clusters with one GPU and four GPU. Uh, this is the raw experimental results. Uh, as you can see, those five different applications, we're running them on these different platforms. The first one on the left, uh, everybody has the same single point of the five applications. On the desk uh, CPU, desktop CPU, uh, sounds like a benchmarking starting point. As we can see that, uh, for most of the other GPU or multi-GPU platforms, we could lower their uh, response time uh, significantly. Uh, but one of the applications, as you can see, the yellow one here, which is a tweet classification, the reason for that is that we are not using big data sets, but there's a lot of small uh, tasks or small data items for each item, for each tweet, we need to do the processing. So that's why, in fact, they cannot leverage the GPU. This, um, in fact, agrees with uh, what Jordan just introduced. Some applications, we cannot leverage GPU. Uh, they run the best on CPU uh, as compared to here. In some of the applications, for example, this uh, deep blue line here, that's the side to map, to map the features. And that leverages the best, uh, the GPUs. For example, the desktop GPU and the platform A, uh, single GPU and multi-GPU significantly reduced the time to run. Uh, it was almost like 20 or 30 times. So um, the results is really various. Some of them can be improved a lot. Some of them cannot leverage GPU. Uh, if we do the correlation analysis using a single GPU, uh, we can see here that uh, RCI, they can leverage the CPU core a lot. It's a positive uh, relationship here. And the tweet uh, really relies a lot on the CPU speed. That's why they have a positive relationship here. And for cloud classification and PM 2.5 retrieval, 
they can leverage the GPU memory a lot. So the bigger G GPU memory we have, the bigger GPU core numbers we have, uh, we can run uh, faster the application. And for Axia and uh, SATA2 map, both GPU core and storage motherboard speed, which means data, data sets transmitting between the motherboard and storage and GPU matters a lot here. That's why they are a positive correlation. And the RAM size also uh, means a lot for the data sets, which if they're big, uh, that's the case for cloud class classification and PM 2.5. Uh, for multi-GPU, there are some slight difference here. Uh, again, the CPU core number uh, is still important for tweet classification and the GPU memory and GPU core are critical for PM 2.5 retrieval and started to map, map, mapping here. And storage and motherboard speed is important for the cloud classification and RAM size is important for PM 2.5 retrieval and started to map. Uh, so as a conclusion of that and recommendation, uh, what we did is that we developed the five open source packages and we put in the user guide how to use them and how what kind of uh, coding we need to do to make them GPU compatible and also use the several metrics to quantify the performance of different applications running on the different GPU machines. And we could in general use GPU resource to optimize our, our stance applications, but some of them may not be able to leverage the GPU computing power. And we also compared the performance on different platforms. Uh, here we didn't specify which platform did the best uh, the, because the objective of this is to see how these applications run on different GPUs uh, and GPU uh, platforms. So uh, not necessarily to see which one performs the best. And then we had a, uh, we developed a test battle report which details the findings and the process we conducted. So specifically on the recommendations, um, the GPU could be considered to improve the AI machine learning applications long time. And if the input data size is small, uh, probably just single GPU is good enough. They cannot leverage multi-GPUs. Uh, we can use multi-GPU and data power of strategies, uh, but they cannot guarantee a speed up because the deep learning algorithms vary from different applications. The model behind the algorithms are also different. And more investigation is needed to identify the bottleneck of GPU utilization. And that's what we're doing now. I have a few slides on that. And also we suggest to pay more attention to applications initially designed for CPUs and adding extra or even replacing existing programming packages. An application could be originally designed for single GPU uh, can also be parallelized to run on multi GPUs. And we have a workflow uh, kind of recommendation about how to uh, bring your earth science applications onto single GPU or multi GPU. And this is a workflow. Uh, so first look at your application, see if it's GPU supported. If it is, uh, we could go through to leverage the GPU. If not, we need to GPU enable the application and then come back to see if it's uh, GPU enabled. And for each of the step, for the complex ones, as you see, we have a reference here, one, two, uh, 17, 16, 18. And those are the user guide we put up and you can follow those steps to GPU enable or multi-GPU enable your applications. So this is the recommendations. I don't have time to go through the details, but uh, you're welcome to look at the reference links at the end of the slides deck. So the next step is do we need to uh, develop user guide to leverage uh, the tools to analyze the impact factor and detect a bottleneck of where we can reduce the time spend. And also uh, we need to do more careful uh, comparison about the applications and different platforms and leveraging other AI machine learning models, for example, graph and recurrent neural networks, and also update the report based on uh, these new findings. And so what we need to do is we need to look at the entire pipeline once we load the data and the model to the computer, how the data is exchanged within the computer nodes itself, between the CPU memory, the CPU, and the GPU memory, and the GPU cores. So we have labeled them from step one to until we get the final results combined uh, back to CPU in eight steps. In these eight, eight steps, there are different ways to optimize them and different, uh, some of them could be have a better GPU or faster run 
or get a bigger run. Uh, so one of the opposite tool is that uh, the TF profiler. We looked at that, for example, one of the suggestions they had after we did this, uh, use the accelerated linear al algebra compiler to accelerate the model. Uh, in fact, for this specific application, we would be able to reduce the GPU launch time from about um, uh, here, the kernel launch time, uh, which is the yellow part on the top figure. Uh, if you compare that to the bottom figure, you can see that it was reduced almost by two or three times. So a uh, TP provider could help us uh, provide some guidance. Another part is definitely to look at really the parallelize the data pipeline so that we can leverage more GPUs and reduce the data transmission between CPU and GPU and across GPU cores or across uh, CPU cores so that we can um, reduce the time spent on data conversion. So they, these are the references I just mentioned that each of these goes to a GitHub document or a YouTube uh, video that we record for how to uh, improve and how to code the EarthSense applications, uh, five of them to leverage the GPU or leveraging four GPUs for your applications. And please feel free to look at this. And if there's uh, any question, we'd be happy to answer them and discuss with you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Phil. Any questions for Phil before we open the floor up? Phil, you and I have been talking about uh, some of these benchmarks for a while, and the question about uh, increasing the training set size is one, uh, yep. is one of the questions about that, that I have and how that could affect some of the performance measurements. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, increasing the training data sets would be able to leverage in more GPUs. We did some initial study. We didn't do the systematic study on that yet. Uh, one of the bottleneck we're having now is uh, to produce big training data sets. Um, one of the simple ways we did is just double or triple the same training data sets, but that will not uh, change the final results. And we did get some kind of uh, computing test uh, performance gains by using that in comparison between CPU and GPU. Uh, so yeah, bigger training data sets will definitely be able to help us leverage more GPU, and GPU cores and GPU loads. The nice thing I like about what you've got is the YouTube videos and the, and the how tos. So if people want to use that um, and try it out, that's that'd be fantastic. Yeah, in fact, um, it would be great if um, uh, there's comments, questions on that, and uh, people could come to use that. And if you have any questions, just let, let us know. Uh, that's one good thing about uh, within the ESIP family. Then, uh, in fact, uh, ESIP has a a project or program called um, uh, the ESIP Labs. Or we could do something like a hackathon. Uh, I don't know if uh, Aniston or Mike can speak to that, the ESIP Labs and the hackathon ac activities. Uh, maybe we can work with the ESIP community to see who has Earthstance applications. They want to leverage GPUs and we can work with them. Uh, for example, we have about half a year until this ESIP summer meeting. Uh, we can look into uh, several of those and then see if we can further leverage the GPUs for our science. Yeah, I can speak to that a bit, mostly to say that Annie Burgess is definitely the point person for the ESIP lab. The new RFP is out and it's specifically focused on water resources and wildfire this year. But I know that there are several programs in place and that collaboration is definitely Annie's and the ESIP Labs MO. And there's actually a couple of folks in the group right now um, who have worked with Annie and have done a couple of ESIP Lab projects and may want to speak to um, the ESIP clusters that they run. So Jensen, not to put you on the spot, but you were the, the person who came to mind thinking of that. Hi, Edison. Uh, yeah, we, we have uh, we have several ongoing projects in the machine learning cluster, and uh, would be really great if uh, the GPU can be leveraged. But most of the, most of the models right now is like tree based, so I'm not sure 
that will be like use case for you because I think a GPU is more usable for like your network or like um more advanced models, but unfortunately we are still using the chip based like XGBOS random forest. <laughs> um so but yeah, yeah, we we would really love to um collaborate with everyone and see if we can make a use case before the summer meeting. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, so, so maybe uh, anything, another point is about a hackathon. I don't know if we did that. Uh, I, I remember that in the air quality cluster, we did something like a hackathon, pick a few key use case and spend a few months to kind of improve the application and develop something to uh, show the uh, the effectiveness and the, the power of um, the ESIP community that we can solve the problem. And we could demonstrate that. But do we still have something or a formalized process for doing hackathon? Sorry, my Zoom is being a little slow. So um, as far as I know, there is not a formal process for doing a hackathon. I would think that doing one during the July meeting is the best option. Um, we have the longest block of time that we set aside for doing like a, a deep dive. Um, so that's usually when most hackathons happen. I know that's when the air quality cluster did theirs. Um, I know there have been a handful of data bonds that have happened. So it's a really good time to do like work sessions and then follow it up with several workshops or um, kind of like hackathon check-ins after that. So definitely I, I will loop in Annie and Megan because um, they are they're definitely the brains behind setting up some of those events. Stan, I, I don't want to put, put you on the spot, but I, I would hope you know that if we do something like this, maybe you you and Nvidia might be able to be a, a partner in something like that for the summer. Uh, certainly, we've hosted a lot of hackathons and have a lot of experience with that. So we, we'd certainly like to get involved. We can provide mentors, even system access, I believe. Yeah, I think I'm great. Uh, uh, sorry, Dan, could I follow up to your question to you, Stan? Um, yes, yeah, so Stan, you mentioned that you have done some um, hackathon and help the community. Do, do you have a process like uh, some kind of application or uh, we just work with the team and you can link us with your team to work together, do something? Uh, yes, and I can describe a little of that. We do have a review committee and there's a few from NVIDIA that are specific to that domain. But then we enlist uh, NASA, other organizations who are involved. They assign reviewers and we all come up with a final scoring that accepts the teams who participate. And usually it's around 10 teams per hackathon in the format we have. And we've done them specifically at sites like NASA AIM, specific to NASA, but they've invited out five people. Uh, there's a number of different formats I guess can be applied. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stan. Uh, Mike has uh, the hands up. Hi. Uh, yeah, there's uh, a couple of things that might be helpful. Uh, the NASA Space Act agreement with NVIDIA supports hackathons specifically. And uh, so if there needs to be some kind of formal agreement that can be used, that's not hard to get put in place. I mean, to, to fix it up so that it handles a specific hackathon. Uh, but that's certainly uh, one agreement that exists uh, with NASA and between NASA and NVIDIA. And it certainly, since NASA is participating, it certainly would cover uh, this situation. Um, and the other one was that what we did with the air quality hackathon was we had a longish session at the um, summer meeting. And then we had arranged to uh, where we were able to form teams and talk about what we're going to do and sort of, you know, do all that organizational stuff. And then we spent the next month doing the, um, the actual uh, code work and then demonstrated at the next, at the meeting of the air quality group 
after um, that summer meeting. And, uh, and that actually worked out really well. We got a lot of participation. It does take some people who are interested um, in actually and willing to put the energy into making it work, but it's a very effective way of, uh, of starting to get to understand some of these things for people who really don't have a lot of experience. As many of you know, Megan is lightning quick with her responses via Slack. So she already got back to me about the possibility of doing um, a hackathon that dovetails with the next ESIP meeting in the summer. And she said that we can talk about it during the, the session submission process, which will happen uh, later this spring. And we can have an ongoing conversation about the specific support and details that you might need to have it hosted, at least in tandem with the ESIP meeting. And thanks for sharing your experience too, Mike. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you, Alison. That, that's really quick from Megan. <laughs> yeah, and thank you, Mike, for sharing our quality cluster experience and hackathon and uh, mentioning about the, uh, the cooperative agreement that we can leverage. Um, so do, do we have any other comments, questions, advice from the audience here? Uh, Jensen, you have your hands up. Yeah, uh, just want to uh, ask if uh, because we are we are also organizing the uh, ML tutorials, collecting the use cases. Um, it'll be great if we can like develop some tutorials for the community to just because uh, the GPU is more like uh, advanced and it needs a lot of tedious steps to follow. So it'll be great if we can just uh, put together some specific use case so people can follow step by step. Um, so the, this day at NASA, so we, we and Jordan knows this, we've actually uh, have a set of tutorials that we created, sort of one, one use case from each of our four science groups, um, you know, planetary, helio, earth, and, and astro, uh, that I think, Jordan, we might be able to share more broadly than, um, than just NASA. So. I'll talk to Mark about that, uh, Mark Carroll, and see if we could share some of those, and that could be a good basis for what you're talking about. And just planting this as an idea for where some of those tutorials could live in the ESIP space, uh, we could always do that as a blog and have a how-to introduction via the blog and then preview yep. that for any follow-up activities you all do. These are all Python-based, uh, notebook-based uh, tutorials with uh, with training sets, and and typically you don't need massive amounts of GPUs to do these things. We can just do the you know do it on the CPU, and uh, GPUs can just help accelerate them. Yeah, that would be a great help to the ESIP community to adopt uh, AI machine learning and and also GPU. Okay, we're about two minutes to closing of the session. Uh, anyone have um, any last thoughts or takeaways? Uh, anything I know that you see ask us to kind of collect some three points of uh, takeaways message. How do you handle that? We have... Well, I, 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 I mean, I, I, we just mentioned one one takeaway, which is I think many of us have some some initial AI ML tutorials or, or simplified models that we could share with each other. I think that's one of the takeaways that I I, I saw here, um, and and I think that's a great one um, that we can that we can do. Another one is is you know um, the recognition that that you don't actually always need a, a, a GPU. No offense, Stan, uh, to solve all of your AI ML problems. <laughs> that was a uh, well, it may they may sound like an obvious statement. Uh, sometimes we forget that. So there's some a couple of things that came to mind when I was thinking about those takeaways. Yeah, and also in the loads book uh, the, for this session, there, there's uh, the last part. In fact, uh, the uh, takeaway message. And uh, if you have uh, any message, please uh, you, you can put it in the chat window. We can move yep. over there, or you can put it in the loads taken uh, file. Yeah, and thank you. The, the, a note about the hybrid models, local and a combination of local and cloud processing for 
uh, for the really the true ecosystem in the open science world uh, is going to be needed, right? So uh, that that I agree with that, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, Stan, and uh, Jordan. Thank, yeah, you thank you for you. speaking to to the group, and thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, uh, session. And we, as we discussed, we look forward to working together more and have. Uh, a more in-depth discussion in the ESIP summer meeting. I will be following up. Um, yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. So we're closing this session and the next event that we have is our uh, first coffee break. So it's a virtual coffee break. If you join via Kiko chat, you can head straight to the wonder space and we're focusing on introducing all of our community fellows. So. If you'd like to give them an introduction, um, help them make some connections, that would be a great thing to do. And then tomorrow we've got all of our workshops and the research showcase. Yeah, thank you, Anison and Mike, for helping facilitating us. Thank yep, you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, folks.